Hi there, my name is Chris Harris I'm from AlloyTutors.com and welcome to this video on Gibbs Free Energy Change and this is the first video. So in this video we're going to look at a, a brief introduction to what Gibbs Free Energy is. We're also going to look at the equation that's involved. Uh, we're going to go through a worked example uh, using Gibbs Free Equation and we're also going to look at the feasibility uh, of a, uh, a reaction uh, when we change the temperature of it uh, without using numbers. So this is a qualitative description rather than a quantitative description. Okay, so we're going to start with a, just a brief introduction to what Gibbs is. Now, Gibbs was named after Josiah Gibbs, uh, who was an American mathematician who uh, came up with this idea of um, working out what we call free energy. Uh, and free energy is calculated by taking the enthalpy change of a reaction and taking it away from the temperature multiplied by the entropy. So basically what he did is he took the enthalpy and the entropy part of a reaction and put them together to decide if a reaction is feasible at a given temperature. So, um, and this is basically what he came up with. And delta G is the symbol we use to give, uh, or to symbolize uh, Gibbs free energy. And if delta G is zero or minus one, then that means that the reaction is feasible at the stated temperature, but it might not be feasible depending on the temperature or might never be feasible, which I'll come on to later in a minute. But his equation is given like this. His delta G equals delta H minus T delta S, where delta H is the entropy change in kilojoules per mole, temperature is measured in Kelvin, and the entropy change is measured in joules per Kelvin per mole, which is over here. And you've got to watch out for these units as well. Make sure you're converting them correctly. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to go through a, a worked example um, using that equation over there just to show you how it works. So we've got an example here. So we're going to calculate delta G for the following reaction. And this reaction is iron reacting with oxygen to form iron oxide. So this is effectively like a rusting process. Now, uh, we've been given the entropy change for this reaction. It's very exothermic. It's minus 822 kilojoules per mole. And in blue, uh, we've got entropy values as well of the different species involved. So this is Fe203 is 90 uh, um, joules per kelvin per mole. Uh, iron is 27.2 and O2 is 205. So what we're going to do is we're going to work out the um, delta G. Now for delta G to be calculated, we need to know delta S. Now, this delta S is entropy of the system only. So if you're not sure on how to calculate uh, the entropy of a system, I have done a video where we use that. Uh, if you just click on the link below, and you can have a look at that video there. But I'm going to assume that you know how to do this for this purpose. Okay, so we're going to start with uh, calculating our delta S. Now, I'm going to write this in uh, blue, so it's different from the, from the actual equation over there. So um, if we had to work out delta S, of the system, I'm going to put that there, delta S of the system, and this is total entropy of the product minus the total entropy of the reactants. So the entropy of the product you can see over there is 90. So we're going to put 90, which is over there, and we're going to subtract that away the total entropy of these. Now we've got iron, but we need to multiply it by two because we've got a two in front of it on the start there. So it's going to be two times. 27.2, okay, uh, and then obviously we're going to have one and a half, so it's 1.5 times by the entropy of O2, which is 205. Okay, now if we put that all into a calculator, uh, we should get a value of minus 271.9, minus 271.9, and this is in joules per Kelvin, Per mole. Okay, so this is our delta S of a system, and that's really important because we need to use it in this value here. So the, lo the last step really is just to calculate delta G. So the delta G is delta H minus T delta X. Now delta H, we've been told, is minus 822, but this is in kilojoules, and our answer for delta G has got to be in joules. It could be in kilojoules as well, but for the purposes of this, because our entropy is in joules, we're going to convert this into, uh, into joules. So by doing that, we're going to multiply it by 1,000, which I'm just going to put times 10 to the, times 10 to the 3, which means multiply it by 1,000. 
Okay, so that's our delta H bit. We're going to subtract that away from our temperature. Uh, now, this was at uh, room temperature, so I'm just going to put 298 Kelvin. Okay, and we're going to uh, multiply that bit by uh, delta S. Now, delta S is what we just worked out here. This is minus 271.9. And if we put that into our calculator, we should get quite a large value. Remember, this is in joules as well, and the joules are very small. But uh, the value we should get is minus 7409 uh, 73.8. And this is in joules, uh, joules per mole, because this is a, an energy change. So you can see that this value is negative. Now that tells us that, that this reaction uh, should be feasible according to Gibbs energy. Um, however, the reaction, obviously we don't see iron reacting with oxygen right in front of our faces. Um, it does happen, but it happens over a long period of time. So just because it says that it's feasible uh, and it's a spontaneous reaction at room temperature, it doesn't mean that you're gonna see something immediately. And this could be because of the activation energy, could be so high for this that um, kinetically, this thing is very, very, very slow. And it will be feasible, but just over a long period of time. You've really got to remember that. Just because you don't see anything happening doesn't mean that the reaction is not feasible. Okay, so there's our answer there. That's how we've worked out delta G. And we've also made a comment on what that means as well in terms of feasibility. Okay, so let's suppose in, we don't actually have any numbers. We've got a comment on the feasibility of reaction depending on the uh, changing of the temperature. And this is uh, described in a qualitative term. Now, before we do this, I just want to take the equation and split it up into two. So this is what I put here. So we're predicting if a reaction is feasible without numbers uh, to calculate it. Uh, we split up the delta G equation into two halves. And you can see I've highlighted this in green and blue with the green section in delta H. Uh, and I've clumped the T delta S into another section. So effectively, to make delta G negative, which means uh, zero or negative, which means the reaction is feasible, T delta S bit, the blue bit, must be bigger than the delta H bit. If there's a potential opportunity for that to happen, then the reaction might be feasible. If there is no chance of T delta S actually being bigger than delta H, then the reaction will never be feasible. And so I'm going to go through a few scenarios just to show you uh, how we can work that out. So if we have an enthalpy change that was positive and we have an entropy change that was positive, uh, then if we increase the temperature, then T delta S is going to be bigger than delta H. And so what we can comment on is if this is feasible, uh, and I'll do this in blue, so we say, yeah, that's feasible, but only uh, if the temperature is high enough. Okay, so we're going to put that on there, above a certain temperature. Okay, and again, if you think about it, if we have the delta H bit is positive, uh, we're going to subtract this. If the delta S is positive as well, then if the T bit is big enough, then this blue bit will be bigger, the T delta S bit will be bigger than delta H, but only if the temperature is big enough. And so that would give you a delta G that was negative, Hence, it's feasible. Okay, so we we'll look at the next one. Delta H is negative, which is this bit here, and the delta S bit is positive, which is um, which is this bit in the blue. Then, um, obviously, delta G will become more negative, irrespective of the temperature. So, yeah, this one is always feasible if we have this set up here. So, a situation where enthalpy change is exothermic, which is favourable uh, enthalpically, which is negative value, and entropically, if the more positive the value is, then obviously you've got a very favorable reaction and this uh, reaction will go. We don't even have any numbers, but we can make a comment on it quantitatively. Okay, so <coughs> if we have delta H was negative, which is a favorable process, exothermic, but delta S wasn't, then it's not likely that T delta S is going to be greater than delta H in this case. And again, it depends on the temperature, um, but it could be. So we'll put usually, and again, it does depend. It does depend on the temperature at which this react this this actually happens. But if you split this up, you can see what I mean. Okay. Uh, the last one. If we say that delta H is positive, 
which was not very uh, uh, favorable because it's an endothermic reaction. We know that endothermic reactions are not a favorable process, but delta S is negative, which is um, not favorable either. Uh, then delta G is always positive, always. And you can see it here. So if this was positive, and we subtract this away from something that was negative, which effectively turns it into a positive because a minus and a minus makes it positive, then your delta G will always be positive. It's never going to be negative. So reactions that have this combination will never work uh, at that temperature. So a, a positive uh, delta H and a negative delta S, as we increase the temperature, the reaction is going to become less and less likely that, um, that it's going to happen and it's going to not be feasible. But you do need to be able to comment uh, on the feasibility of reactions qualitatively as well, using this information here. But what really helps is just split it up into two halves. And the key thing is that the T delta S bit, the blue box, has got to be bigger than the green delta H box. Uh, and that's because delta, H, delta G has to be zero or negative. So if you can remember that, that should help you. Um, and if you want, you can even put in hypothetical numbers to help you get a, a number if you're finding it difficult to, to try and understand this. But um, that's it. Hope that helps. Bye.